20 years ago this week, U.S. forces were speeding toward Iraq's capital city after invading the country weeks earlier. With them and waiting for them in Baghdad were hundreds of journalists who would go on to document a war that took a brutal toll on many Iraqis, U.S. personnel, and sometimes the journalists themselves. Nick Schifrin spoke with some of them earlier this week. The invasion of Iraq is one of the rare moments that divide history. There's a time before and a time since. And those who document the first draft of that history are the journalists who embedded with U.S. forces, who covered the war from Iraqi communities, and those who continue to return. To discuss how the invasion unfolded, how the story evolved, and how the legacy of Iraq continues to haunt, I'm pleased to be joined by three of my journalist colleagues. Lulu Garcia Navarro, opinion audio podcast host to The New York Times, former NPR and Associated Press reporter who spent eight years on and off in Iraq, including living in Iraq, including in Baghdad during the invasion. Saul Juan Georges, a Washington Post staff photojournalist who left his native Iraq in 1998 and returned for the first time recently. And Chip Reed, a former CBS and NBC News correspondent who was embedded with U.S. Marines for the invasion and is now writing a book about those Marines. Welcome very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Re really appreciate your being here. Let's go back in time. Uh, let's start with the invasion uh, and take a look, Chip, uh, at some of your coverage. What they are doing here is literally digging in. They do that so if there is any shrapnel flying across the field at night, any artillery or mortar rounds fired at the camp, it will fly over them if they are down below the surface of the ground. And that is hard work indeed, believe me. Behind me, you can see the smoke rising. That is the remnants uh, of a battle about an hour-long firefight that we were right in the middle of. How do you remember the invasion today? I got to say, in 33 years as a TV journalist, this is the one story that was the most jaw-dropping, the most uh, otherworldly than anything. I don't have a military bone in my body, but I it went into this war feeling it was a gigantic mistake. Uh, but uh, it's not something I think of in a negative way now because the experience for me was so extraordinary. I developed tremendous respect for these Marines I was with, 18-year-old kids who were making life and death decisions like that, I have tremendous respect for people who will put their lives on the line to answer the nation's call, even if it's a bad call. Hmm. Lulu, you were based in Baghdad for the invasion. How did the drumbeat of war look from your perspective when you were reporting out of Saddam Hussein's Ministry of Information? Yeah, I was there um, when the weapons inspectors were there. Um, and it was a surreal place. Uh, it was a place full of fear. We had minders all the time, people that were assigned to us by the Ministry of Information that would inform on us, would inform on the people that we were going to talk to. Uh, but I will never forget uh, the day when it was clear that the United States was going to invade. This quite feared and heinous uh, member of the Ministry of Information, I went up to him and I said, you know, why, are you why aren't you preparing? And he looked at me and he said, well, you know what? it might not be a bad thing after all. And all of a sudden I realized that this veneer, this facade that I had been um, sort of sold in Iraq um, was very, very different than the reality and uh, something, something else was coming uh, in its stead. Uh, fast forward to 2004. Uh, mm -hmm. You were at a celebration, effectively, uh, invited by a, a U.S. official at Saddam Hussein's palace. What did you see? It was um, as the U.S. occupation authority was coming to a close, they were going to be handing over, quote unquote, sovereignty to an Iraqi government. And they were billing it as sort of the end of the Iraq war. And they threw a barbecue in Saddam Hussein's palace. There were 19 year old uh, soldiers in swimming trunks doing cannonballs <laughs> into the pool, munching on corn and eating hot dogs and hamburgers. And in the midst of all this, um, Paul Bremer, who had sort of overseen a period of absolute chaos and hubris and mismanagement, uh, shed a tear and was talking about what a great job he'd done. And then, then President um, Bush uh, came on via video link and told everyone in his Texas twang to enjoy a good barbecue. There were no Iraqis there. There were only um, Americans. And I think it was very symbolic of what was to come. Absolutely. So on, you were a teenager. Uh, at the time, living in the United States. Um, what did your family experience during these first few years of the war? We never thought Iraq would fall that fast. And my family were like all Iraqis. 
we're believing that democracy is finally going to come to that country. We we're finally going to be free. Um, uh, I was worried about my relatives. I was worried about my grandma, my grandpa, who was still in Iraq. One of my cousins were kidnapped by a terrorist group, then we had to pay to get him out. Uh, my other cousin was killed uh, by a terrorist group in 2013 who were targeting Christians. And then uh, when I returned during my last trip, I discovered that uh, my grandpa's grave, a little bit 21 miles outside Baghdad, was destroyed by U.S. soldiers who were looking for uh, weapons. So many and, years uh, ago. I couldn't believe to see my grandpa's uh, casket all destroyed after all these years. And, and so, of course, so many Iraqi families have stories tragically yeah, yeah. like that. What we're talking about now is the sectarian conflict that, that really engulfed the country. Uh, and Lulu, you filed a particular report we wanted to play uh, for NPR in 2005. Twisted metal and debris that litter what was a market area. Women scream as they look for loved ones among corpses burned to a brittle black at the hospital morgue. Most of the dead are Shiite. And Baghdad, too, is burning. How much burned? That was every day in Iraq. Um, every day brought some new horror that was unleashed on an Iraqi family, um, some terrible thing that had happened. Once the civil war was unleashed, uh, families fought against other members of their families. Neighborhoods were ripped apart. Uh, hearing just that woman scream, it, it reminds me so much of... of that was the sort of music of Baghdad, um, this terrible, terrible lament um, of just pain and loss and fear. And so it was a very hard war to cover. And a very hard war to experience for, for so many uh, Iraqis. So on, I'm going to fast forward here. And you, you mentioned that you went back. What kind of country was waiting for you when you got back? It's definitely not the same country. People uh, are kind of numb to what happened to them. It's really sad to see that um, people kind of, uh, you see that giving up hope in them, but they still kept the Iraqi in them to always enjoy life with, with what little they have. And uh, for me, it was a trip to kind of check my history, look back at my history. Uh, when I was a child, uh, we barely have an electricity. We would get them a few hours a day. We had to leave because it just life was so, so difficult. And when I return, I mean, things are a little bit different, of course, uh, but as a country went through many wars and many conflicts, I mean, you don't, you don't expect it to change in one day. Mm. Uh, the scars of, of the war run, run deep uh, across all of your guys' experience, uh, including Chip for the Marines who you embedded with. Uh, tell us the story uh, of, of Mike Martinez. Well, Mike Martinez is one of the uh, 42 Marines I interviewed for the book. Uh, had, the title of the book is Battle Scars, and most of the battle scars that are in the book are psychological, not physical. I have a picture of him with his family at Camp Pendleton when he came home. His wife, Stephanie, who's in the photograph, holding their brand new newborn baby, and Mike is holding Mike Jr. And you can see that he is just in another world. And it, when I interviewed him almost 20 years later, he said he just uh, he felt like he was walking on Mars. And, and, and we've actually got a clip of that interview, you talking to Mike uh, and his son, Mike Jr. I wasn't physically abusive, but I could I, I could be mentally abusive where I was I would go act like a drill instructor on my kids. And mm -hmm. I would I would scream at them like a drill instructor. Why is my dad like this? Like. Like, why is this happening to us? Like, I, just, I wanted to talk back, but it's, like, you know, for his kids, I'm not going to say anything to my dad. He's scary. He's scary. Scary. Uh, he was. And uh, he, his addiction was food. It wasn't drugs or alcohol. He ballooned up to 340 pounds, and he said, basically, I'm big, I'm bad, I'm intimidating, and that's the way I am, and I'm always right. Finally, he got help from the VA in 2019. That's mm. uh, a long time after this yeah. began. And now he is in full-fledged post-traumatic growth. Mm. I mean, he's going to school to become a teacher, to leave a very tedious job he has now. The family is vastly happier. And, you know, the message in all of this, which is what so many of these Marines told me, is that if you are suffering from PTSD or PTS, just post-traumatic stress without a diagnosis, get help. As I said, the scars run deep uh, for everyone. Uh, and Lulu, you did a, a powerful podcast recently for The New York Times uh, with your longtime Iraqi colleague, uh, Ali Hamdani, uh, and he admitted this to you. One thing that I may have not 
always conveyed <laughs> perfectly, I would say, is how much people resented your presence in the country. How much people literally hated foreigners because they associated them with, with the invasion. How do you deal with that today? It was hard to hear how so many Iraqis did not welcome our presence as journalists. And in fact, many years later, um, I had someone contact me on Facebook. I had done a report on him. And um, he tracked me down, and he said, I wanted to reach out to you to tell you that you ruined my life. And I don't think that you knew what you were doing here when you were coming into my house to interview me. Um, sometimes we need to reckon ourselves as journalists um, also with the legacy of that war. And Salwan, you get the last word on that legacy. What is the legacy for Iraqis of a war whose very premise was disproven? Um, it's a hard one. You know, the, the legacy have really changed the life of Iraqis. Uh, people still struggle to get like simple needs like jobs, electricity including my family, where we, we suffered a lot. And when I went back, I mean, my, my uncle was a translator with the U.S. Marines and lost his life by a car bomb in Ramadi during the war. So uh, it has, I mean, I don't know. The legacy, it's, uh, it's a hard question because it's just people still trying to figure out what happened there. And we'll continue to. Salwan Georges, thank you very much. Lulu Garcia-Navarro, thank you very much. Chip Reed, appreciate it.